computer. Yeah. And that's recording. Okay. Um, hi guys, I'm Yunja and I'll be taking you for your HLSD revision lecture. It's kind of boring. I really tried my best, but it's just the content is just going to be me reading off a slide. So if you prefer to read slides, I'm happy for you to leave because I have everything on my slides. Um, okay. And I was thinking if you have questions, feel free to send them to me. But when I did practice it, I didn't get enough time to finish. So I might not be able to answer your questions straight away. Um, so I might leave time at the end if I have time. Um, and there's my resources. Okay, so I tried to split it up as best as I could um, into kind of forming topics. So we'll start off with like basic theories. Um, and then we'll do your actual lifespan development and then psychopathology. So what can go wrong basically. Um, or not really wrong, but I guess, you know, what disorders are there? And then finally, you know, your later stages of life. Um, so starting off with theories and concepts, your, you've got your biopsychosocial framework, basic concepts, and then your major theoretical perspectives. Um, start off with questions. I saw some people looking at the slides, so some of you probably already know the answers, but I'll give you guys a few seconds. Yeah, so a lot of people have said D. That is correct. It is D. Um, and we'll go through all of this in the content after the questions. Um, your next one. Um, this one was more just kind of figuring out which one was wrong and then getting to which one was right, but we'll also go through this. All right, so to start off with, there's the biopsychosocial framework, and that's basically what the name says it is. So um, apparently in life we have basic forces, so there's biological, which is all, you know, all your biologi biological stuff, um, like genetics, your health-related stuff. Psychological is like how you think and how you look at things around you. Social, cultural is how you interact with people, you know, society, culture around you. And then there's also life cycle forces, which is basically thinking about whether the, the same event can happen to different people of different ages and affect them differently. Um, an example there is like if you lose parents when you're seven versus when you're 70. Well, your parents probably wouldn't be alive then, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, your basic concept, so nature versus nurture, is basically the balance between how much of your growth is dependent on what kind of person you already were genetically versus how you were influenced. Um, continuity versus discontinuity is, is development continuous or gradual or discontinuous and there's like abrupt stages or shifts. Um, universal versus context specific is thinking about um, does everyone grow in the same way or do we all have different development like stages or like the way we develop is different because of our environment? Um, next, so those are the basic concepts and now these are the theoretical perspectives. So like the theories that these people talked about. Um, uh, so there's psychodynamic, which is Fruit and Erickson. Learning is Skinner and Bandura, cognitive is Piaget's. The information processing theory, I put it here anyway, but we'll go over it again later when we apply it um, to child cognitive development. Um, ecological systems is Bronf and Brenner and life science bolts. Um, so starting off with your psychodynamic theories. So the first one's Frood. And basically he thinks that um, everything we do at a certain age is driven by like pleasure and what we want, but it might be unconscious. Um, it's discontinuous because it's got different stages. Um, and the flaw of this is that there are absolute stages, which is not necessarily reflective of what actually happens. Um, so oral, zero to one, is weaning. Anal, one to three, kind of like toilet training. Phallic, sexuality, latency is kind of the period between when you're not really feeling sexual, I guess, but you're more social. 
um, and then genital is 11 onwards and you're basically, you know, getting a partner, etc. Um, Erickson's psychosocial theory is also discontinuous, so there's also stages, um, but it's a lot more socialized than um, Freud's, because this one basically says that um, it's also about how we interact with other people, and it's saying that at each stage there's some kind of goal or some kind of challenge that we need to pass. Um, and basically from birth to one, it's about, you know, thinking that the world is a good place or a bad place. Um, one to three is knowing that you're an independent person, that you can make your own decisions. Three to six is being able to handle failure and, you know, being able to try new things. Um, six to adolescence is um, learning to work with others. Um, and then during adolescence, like your teenage years, it's kind of like finding yourself. <laughs> and then young adulthood is about love and then middle adulthood is about contributing to kids or the younger generations um, and then late life is basically thinking yeah you know I can die happy. Um, your learning theories now so there's also two of these so there's Skinner's operant conditioning. Um, do you need to know about the Ericksonian virtues? I don't even know what those are so probably not. <laughs> Um, I just went through the slides and to be honest, I feel like, um, well, psychology, I mean, not psychology, psychiatry is only like four marks. So you guys don't really have to know this in as much detail as you think you do. And he asks very similar questions every single year. Um, so probably not if I don't know what those are, or I might just not know what those are. Um, Skinner's, yeah. Okay. So Skinner's operant conditioning. Um, this one confused me a lot because I was like, I don't understand. Um, but basically, if you're adding something, it's positive. If the behavior happens more often, it's reinforcement. So if you add something and it happens more often, it's positive reinforcement. If you add something and the behavior happens less often, it's punishment. But it's also positive because you're adding something. Um, and I gave you an example there. So basically, like positive reinforcement is if you get money when you do the chores. Whereas positive punishment would be that your mom tells you off, which is adding something, um, even though you do the chores. So then you're like, well, oh, why do I bother? Um, yeah, and basically, depending on what happens after you do that thing, you are more likely to change what happens next time, um, what you do next time. Um, Bandura's social learning theory. I feel like you, you guys already did this in someone or maybe not, but basically you just, you look at other people and then you imitate them. Um, that's it. Um, Piaget's cognitive development theory. So now we're on to the cognitive ones. So this one's also continuous, discontinuous, sorry. So there's different stages. Um, and it's the idea that children can organize things into schemes. So from birth till two, it's about well, sensory motor, so literally sensation and motor skills. Um, and there's also developmental phenomena, so like kind of like things they develop at that stage. Um, this one is object permanence, so knowing that something is still there even when you can't see it. Um, and there's stranger anxiety, stranger anxiety. Um, Pre-operational thought from two to six or seven, so they, they're not logical, but they can speak and, you know, express things. Um, and this is when they start to do pretend play and they think they're the best person in the world. And they're like, oh my God, hi. And they start blabbering on. Um, concrete operational thought from seven to 11. That's when they start doing math. Um, pretty sure my mom tried to teach me algebra when I was like in prep and I was like, get me out of here. Um, so you start being able to do math um, and also conservation happens, which is basically knowing that like if you, um, like if you have a, a square, I guess, and you flip it, it's the same, maybe not a square, um, like a rectangle, and you flip it, but it's still the same object. Um, formal operational thought, you're just an adult now, so you can reason properly, um, you have logical skills, etc. Um, okay, so we'll come back to this one later as well, but it's basically, the information processing theory is basically where you think of your brain as a computer. So your actual brain, like the anatomical structures are your hardware, um, whereas the software are the programs that are running. So it's like, if you're doing something that is a software, like if I pick up my phone, a software, the action itself is a software, but my brain made me do it. So your brain's a hardware. Um, and this is 
continuous because what happens is it's saying that as we get older we can upgrade our hardware and software um, but then obviously the if we get past a certain point it'll start to degrade just like old computers um, and then there's ecological systems which is Bronf and Brenner um, this one basically is focusing on how everything links together at different levels um, so there's like your microsystem which is directly around the child and it's about you know your family your friends, people directly around them. Um, Meso systems are more about the connections between microsystems or between micro and exosystems. So, for example, a home, a neighborhood, or school. Um, an exosystem is indirect, but not quite at the same level as macro. Um, it's more like things that are still kind of close by, but like they're not really things you can influence, but they can influence you. Um, so like your local government, your mass media, um, whereas macro system is more like things you can't see so much. It's more like your culture, the history, um, and those kind of things that can influence you. Um, lifespan and bolts is focusing on the later years of life. So this is, it's got four key features. So basically it's saying that um, there's multi-directionality. So as we age, we'll gain things, we'll also lose things. For example, we might know more things than we used to, but we might not move as well as we used to physically. Um, plastic plasticity uh, is saying that if you practice something, you'll get better at it, basically. Um, historical context is basically um, the way we develop depends on a lot of factors. Uh, so that in this case, like social, cultural influences, I've got a list there. Um, multiple causation is saying that, well, you develop because a lot of things can contribute to it, not just one thing. Um, and then there's a selective optimization compensation model, which is just saying like, basically, you choose certain things that you want to do. Um, and if it's elective, if you're doing that thing because you want to do it, it's elective. Whereas if it's loss-based, it's because you don't want to do it, but you kind of have to, um, because you're either losing resources or there's a change in an environment which makes you do it. And then what happens is you either compensate um, because you, you want to find an alternative method of getting the same goal, or you optimize, you find the best match between what you have um, and how you can use that to reach your goal. Um, and basically, yeah, you optimize or compensate in order to maintain or enhance the goals that you want to do. Um, okay, human lifespan development. So I have to say that with the theories, probably the main ones to know are probably like the first few I talked about. I feel like the questions tend to revolve around like Freud and Erickson's. Okay, so human lifespan development. So now we're getting into all the social cognitive, all the reflexes, etc. Okay, so newborn and early childhood question. So a lot of people said E, um, and that is correct. Thank you. I spent a lot of time on the slides instead of studying. <laughs> um, so E is correct. Spina bifida is caused uh, when you don't have enough folate. Um, what about this one? You guys got this one too? Yeah, so it's B. Um, so that was a trick because Palmer one is a reflex, but it's not in the APGAR criteria. And this one?
Okay, I'm getting some different answers. Um, this one is D, so we'll go over all of these as well. All right. So, um, important influences on infant development. So, obviously, nutrition is a big one. You need to be, I was about to say nutritionized, that's not a word. Um, you need to have good nutrition. So, um, the main one you need to know is basically folic acid causes spina bifida if you don't have enough. Stress as well. If your mum's stressed while she's pregnant, you're more likely to be prematurely born. Um, and the older the mum is, the more likely she is to have difficulties getting pregnant, um, having miscarriages or stillbirths. And then the teratogens, so things that can um, cause deformities, etc., um, you shouldn't take while you're pregnant. Um, so alcohol is a big one. It causes fetal alcohol syndrome. And then thalidomide, you probably heard of, where um, used to be like morning sickness drug and it causes deformed limbs. Um, there's a couple other ones not as important. Um, in terms of when teratogens or what systems teratogens are more likely to influence, it's your CNS. And the reason for that is if you look at the development on this table, um, your CNS is like developing the whole time. So obviously it's a lot more susceptible to influence rather than everything else. Okay, your APGAR scores. So it basically just um, looks at how healthy your baby is straight after they're born. So they take it at one minute and five minutes. Um, if you get a score above seven, you're good to go. Four to six, uh, maybe some special attention and less than three is life-threatening. Um, and the, the APGAR thing stands for appearance, so how they look, their pulse, their grimace, um, which is like a reflex activity. So how their muscles feel and respiration. Um, these are the actual reflexes. So this is different to the APGAR one. Um, so when you stroke their toes, I mean, when you stroke the sole of their foot, like, like this, like in a C shape kind of, their toes will fan out and that's Babinski. Um, blinking is basically that if there are bright lights or there's loud noise, they'll, they'll close their eyes. Um, Moro is where if their head falls or there's loud noise, they'll kind of like do this embracing motion. Um, suckling, you put anything in their mouth, they'll suck it. Um, palma, you put your finger in their palm or put something in their palm and they'll grab it. Um, rooting is when you stroke one side of their face and they'll turn their face towards that side because they think they're going to get milk. Um, stepping, if you hold them upright, they'll step. And withdrawal is if you prick their foot with a pin, they'll take it away, which kind of makes sense. Um, the newborn states, um, there's basically four. There's alert inactivity, which is when they're awake, but they're not really there. Um, waking inactivity. Oh, no, sorry. Alert inactivity is when they, they're awake and they are there. So they're just watching. Waking inactivity is the one where they just woke up. So they're like, their eyes are open, but they're not really looking. Um, crying. Um, basic is where it builds in volume. Mad, it's just intense or loud the whole time. Whereas pain is often wailing and then you get a pause and they gasp and then they wail again. Um, in terms of sleep cycles, so when they're newborns, they often have a four hour sleep cycle. So they'll spend three hours asleep and one hour awake. Um, three to four months, they'll spend five to six hours asleep. And then six months is about 10 to 12 hours at night. Um, and then temperament is basically what kind of, it's kind of like personality. Um, and it tends to be stable. So after they're born, you kind of already have a temperament or how they react to things. Um, heredity, so like your parents, etc., will actually influence your negative affect the most. So there's three affects. There's, there's basically like extroversion, negative affect, and then there's effortful control. So negative affect is like your anger, your fear, everything kind of bad, I guess you could say. Um, whereas extroversion is about like how happy you are if you like to talk to people etc and effortful control is like being able to focus on things so yeah um locomotion and senses you kind of just have to memorize these um do you really need to know them there's probably only one question on it and it might not even come up um so six to seven locomotion six to seven months is stepping 12 to 15 is walking so yeah by about two years old you can walk um fine motor skills at four months there's like a clumsy reach but by five months they can actually hold things with two hands and it's coordinated um by two to three years they can use zippers but not buttons and the six years they can tie shoes um 
handedness. So by one year old, most children will grab with their right hand because most people are right-handed. But by two years, you know for sure which handed, which pref, which hand they preference. Um, in terms of hearing, at six months, they can they can distinguish between pitches as well as an adult would. But by seven months, they can actually locate where that sound is coming from and judge how far away it is. Um, and by one year, they can see as well as an adult. All right, child cognitive um, and social development. More questions. Yep, lots of A's, that is correct. Um, and we'll go over this stuff as well. So don't worry if you don't know, because I always get worried in these because everyone answers so fast and I'm like, I was still reading the question. Yep, so for those of you who said C, that is correct. Um, and we actually already learned this, so I put the question in the wrong place, but it's fine. <laughs> um, all right, so social development. Um, things that foster attachment between your parents or your caregivers and the baby um, or the child. So there's mutual gaze, which is that children prefer to look at faces than anything else. Um, so if you look at them, they'll look back. Di di dyadic Dyadic synchrony, um, which is basically when your parent reflects your emotions or acts. You probably, you, I think you guys might have done active learning on this. Um, well, we did last year where there's a video and you'll see that the parent mimics the emotions back and it helps to, you know, um, foster attachment. Conversation is mother ease. So like when you see, like, even like I do this, when you talk to a baby, you tend to like talk a bit differently. Like you'll you'll like raise your voice and it'll like make these different pitches and stuff. Um, and it also helps to develop the idea that you take turns in conversation. And the social referencing is just that um, the baby will look at the parent or the guardian to see what they should do, depending on what kind of emotions they're reflecting. Um, factors which influence play or interactions with other kids. So make believe um, is basically going to reflect your values or traditions or what the baby's or the child's being taught growing up. Um, and it helps children explore topics which frighten them. Um, and it also promotes imagination and sociability. And then gender differences. So between two to three years old, they prefer to play with their own gender. Girls will enable or support each other and boys will constrict or compete with each other. Um, and the parental influence is basically that if there's some kind of dispute um, if your parents can help diffuse the aggression, then the children who see that, who see their parents do that, are more likely to be better at um, social stuff. <laughs> um, Timeline, so yeah, about one year old, basically it's parallel play, but you don't really talk to each other. You just play alongside each other. Um, by 15 to 18 months, so a bit over one, you can smile at each other, you can do similar activities, but you're still not really interacting and playing together. But then by two years old, you'll like, you know, play together. Like those, I remember like those wooden kitchen sets where you'd be like, you make the cake and I'll bake it. And then you go in and you do a little thing. Um, so that would happen by about two. Okay. And then we're back to the information processing theory, which is the computer model. So if we apply this now to how children um, or cognitively how children function. We can think about attention as basically when they receive additional cognitive processing. So when, they, when they're paying attention to something, they're getting more information into their hardware that they have to process in their hardware. Um, the orienting response is basically um, alerting um, your infants or children to things which are unfamiliar that they haven't seen before and then habituation is the more they see it and the more they process it in, in their hardware the less they are the less likely they are to react to it again because they've seen it so many times so it helps them ignore things which aren't really dangerous to them um, and then we can also apply it to memory so uh, memory actually begins at birth 
um, and it's actually um, earlier for auditory, but uh, I don't remember anything. I don't know about you guys. Um, and basically during childhood memory will improve with age. So basically like your software or your hardware develops. Um, so newborns have memories that last a few seconds. So if you show them something new and then 10 seconds later you show them again, they'll have a surprise reaction again because they won't remember it. By five months, they can remember faces for up to three months. And by two years, um, they're pretty good at remembering things. And then there's this thing called infantile amnesia. It's not really important, but it's basically a paradox where we don't remember the events which were really important for our development. Okay, Carrie's conceptual change theory. Um, it's about, yeah, experience. So before six or seven, it's intuitive. So we don't really understand like anatomically how things work. For example, your tummy rumbles because it wants to eat, not because you're hungry. Um, whereas after six to seven, it's more like you understand that, oh, it's not my stomach that wants to eat. It just, it's digesting food, you know. Um, children's understanding of death. There's four parts. There's universality, which is um, everyone dies. Irreversibility, you can't come back from the dead. Inevitability, also the idea that you will eventually die. And then causality, there's always a cause to death. Um, and basically, depending on which stage of Piaget's you're in, children will understand these four um, categories differently. Um, and it can also be influenced by like your culture or like your environment. Um, before 10, you don't really understand what death is. You just think of it as going away. Whereas after 10, you can start thinking, oh, they died. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, adolescent development. Take a few seconds for this. E is the correct answer, everything above. What about this one? So the correct answer is B. This one's a bit difficult. Um, we'll talk a bit about um, disabilities and stuff later as well. Um, I think this is the last question for this part. move on all right so the correct answer was the that uh, the correct answer to that one we'll see <laughs> all right um so puberty so your primary sex characteristics are those involved in reproduction and your secondary ones are just other physical signs um other changes there's an increased metabolism in general um and in terms of brain development this is the more important part of puberty um basically teens are more likely to do things with an ambiguous risk so they're more dumb um, and the reason for that is because your reward system is really mature. So you like rewarding yourself and you know how to, but you can't control yourself because your self-control center is really immature. So you tend to do things which are kind of dumb because you just think they're fun. Um, and then teenage pregnancy as well. So things that might contribute to that include ignorance. You think you're invulnerable. You have a lack of motivation to bother to protect yourself or you have a lack of access to means of protection. Um, gender and sexuality. Okay, so um, people might have implicit biases against different sexualities or genders, um, and that can affect your doctor-patient relationships. There's this thing called the implicit association test, and you can use that to see if you do have a bias that you're not aware of. Um, there's a conflict also in terms of um, wanting to transition. 
um, and the idea that maybe if you transition a bit later, you could um, make sure that this is what you want to do. And it also reduces the risk of stigma and bullying. Um, but because you're waiting, then you extend the amount of time that you feel like you have gender dysphoria or you, you're distressed from knowing that you're not the gender you want to be. Um, so gender is basically how you feel about being female, male or other. Um, sex is the biological kind of thing. So you're female, male or intersex. Um, transgender, is ba transgender is basically where you feel like you don't um, identify with the sex that you've been assigned at birth. Um, dysphoria is a distress that comes from knowing that. And then transition is basically the steps taken to um, affirm your gender identity. Um, okay. And then developmental uh, differences. So this is um, a bit about disabilities. So basically you might be um, functionally impaired in some aspects um, and it arises from some differences in development or injury to a developing brain and it can cause lifelong difficulties. Um, and basically the idea with these is that you want to help the person with the developmental difference become independent as best as they can. So in terms of those questions, you are looking to um, help them, not really restrict them. Okay, um, and then you can also apply Erickson's psychosocial theory to developmental differences. So we've got the time, the stages, and then issues that can arise in those stages. So for the first one, from about birth to school, um, there can be issues with trust. So because you constantly have to go into hospital for stuff, um, sometimes you don't have good relationships with other people because you don't get to spend the time to work on those relationships. Um, also, the idea of independence or autonomy, you're relying on other people a lot. Um, you, don't, you don't have as many opportunities for social engagement or learning in general, um, and also expressing initiative because you spend a lot of time working on your differences, basically. Um, in childhood, you there's there can be issues around your, your cognitive or motor impairments. Um, so you might not be able to try new things that you want to do or as well as you want to do them. Um, again, the idea of independence or dependence, ability or disability in play or therapy. Um, in adolescence, it's mostly about um, social stuff. So like if you're included or not, um, and if you can do things by yourself. So independence, independence is kind of like across the board, really. Um, in young adulthood, it, again, it's about social stuff, but it's also more about intimacy and finding like a partner. Um, you can also start thinking about, well, what am I going to do later in life? So employment, um, et cetera. And then in your adult years, um, again, being able to separate your identity from your family because you've probably been very dependent on them throughout. Um, intimacy again and opportunities to contribute and employment could be an issue. Um, and then your later years, there's issues for both the parents and the person with a disability. Okay, adult development. Um, don't have any questions for this one because there weren't any on the exams. So that probably means this is very low yield. Um, basically, there's three things. So there's affective, which is like emotional, um, shared or communal nature, which is your mutual interests, and then sociability and compatibility. So how fun are they to hang around? Um, and there's five stages, acquaintanceship, build up, continuation, deterioration, and ending. Um, in terms of social connectedness, so Australian men tend to experience a loss of friendships, usually around 35 to 54. And the reason they think this happens is because a lot of men base their um, friendships on common interests. And when they stop doing that interest or when they lose that interest, then they lose the friendship as well. And the problem with that is if they're not well connected socially, then there's a risk of illness, disability and unemployment. I mean, sorry, illness, disability and unemployment can cause um, poor social connectedness because you're losing that common interest. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Adult developmental love, there's three basic components again. So there's passion, intimacy, commitment. So they say that if, you, if you're in a relationship and you feel the same type to the same extent, you're more likely to be happy. Um, and the longer the relationship goes on, um, the higher your commitment gets, but the lower your passion and intimacy gets. Um, infa infatuation is basically when you have high passion, but your intimacy and commitment is very low and couples who marry in that stage are more likely to get divorced. 
Um, assortative mating is basically that you select your partner based on similarities and then homogamy is the degree to which you're similar. Not very important, I don't think. Um, abuse. So in relationships, there can be abuse and um, usually that's on a continuum. And um, it often starts off verbal, moves to physical, gets more physical and eventually can end up in murder. Um, you better hope that your partners um, aren't going to do this to you. Um, women in violent relationships will obviously report higher levels of physical and emotional problems. And I think that would apply to men as well. Um, okay, work. So I honestly, I don't think this is important, but I, it's just here. Um, Holland's theory is basically saying that well, it's good to work in a field that's good f in terms of your personality, what you are able to do and what you like, which is uh, probably not going to happen in the real world, but it's a theory, you know, kind of makes sense. Um, and then the social cognitive career theory, which is Bandura, says that it's based on three, uh, six factors. So there's self-efficacy, um, outcome expectations, your interests, um, your choice goals, your support, and what barriers you have in place. Again, this is honestly, you probably don't need to know. Um, unemployment, um, basically the older you are, the more unemployment will impact you. And it's worse for males. People who are more educated will be less stressed about unemployment. Um, and it's associated with an increased risk of suicide. And that's why it's important. Um, it can lead to poor health because there can be illness. You might decide to cope by smoking, by misusing alcohol, having a poorer diet or lifestyle, um, poverty, and also the loss of identity that comes with losing a job. Okay, psychopathologies. So um, basically, we're going to talk about um, the models of development, then the developmental ones, and then the personality disorders. So psychopathology development models. So we'll go back to Fruits, um, but different now. So Fruits says that your head or your brain is made up of three parts. There's your eat, which drives your um, what you want, like in terms of pleasure. Um, your super ego is your values and your morals or what you think is right. And then your ego is reality. So it mediates what you want and what you think is right. Um, and if your eat and your super ego have conflicts, that can cause anxiety. And then your ego can be used to defend yourself against that by just, you know, denying it outright. Um, Multifinality and equifinality. So this is a different model now. Um, Multifinality is basically saying that the same risk factor for psychopathology can lead to different outcomes in different individuals. Whereas equifinality says that different factors can lead to the same outcome. Um, behavioral approaches, so social cognitive, um, kind of like Bandura's, I think, um, is basically observing other people. Um, so you learn how to act through looking at what other people do. Um, and also you believe what they say about you. Um, and there's also social cognition, so how you think about yourself, your other people, your relationships with other people, etc., etc. And cognitive distortions, um, basically things like thinking, nobody loves me, I'm the worst, you know, fuck me. Um, and that's, that can contribute to the onset of behavioural and emotional problems if you keep talking like that to yourself. Um, classical conditioning, I feel like you guys did this, I don't know if you did, but I'm going to skip over it because I think you guys did. Um, but yeah, you can just kind of link to stimuli together and then when you do one stimuli, it'll make the, the response or reflex happen. Um, your biological approach is basically, um, saying that your heredity can predispose, predispose, predispose you, yes, predispose you to an increased risk of developing some kind of mental illness. Um, so things like schizophrenia, depression. Um, and it's also saying that sometimes your neurotransmitters can kind of um, have a role in that. Okay, um, this is more a yield now. So developmental psychopathologies is a question. If you said E, you are correct. Um, so it's often late adolescence. All right, so 
developmental psychopathology is basically studying how those disorders arise and change over time over different stages of development as well. Um, these ones will, um, well, all of these that we're talking about right now will be onset in childhood or adolescence. And we're talking about ADHD, delinquency, depression, and schizophrenia. So ADHD, um, basically it happens um, around preschool time. Um, and you have deficits in attention, um, controlling impulses, and also sometimes regulation of motor activity. It's more common in boys, and it's commonly comorbid with oppositional defiant disorder, which is just being defiant. Um, and symptoms usually six or more suggesting inattention, like careless mistakes, etc. Um, how it occurs or causes, there's kind of a range. Um, it's multifactorial. Um, in terms of management, there's psychological, which is like parental training, pharmacological, um, which can reduce symptoms, but not everyone will actually benefit from pharmacological. So sometimes psychological is better. Um, delinquency. So juvenile delinquency is basically having destructive behavior towards either yourself or others. So you just want to go out and run rampant. Um, it's caused usually if it's got lifelong persistent antisocial behavior that's often at an early age it will continue throughout life um, but there's also an adolescent limited one which is more just about like they want to show off and be like oh i'm an adult now i can like you know ruin your car i can like graffiti it oh i'm so cool and you're like all right we get it um so that's adolescent limited um there's prevention programs they do so teaching people how to control themselves very good um, teaching parents how to effectively discipline their kids, very good. Um, teaching people how to resolve conflicts better. Um, there's also school programs that will encourage you to actually go to school and do well. Um, and then there's also, because um, it's often linked to like social economic status, so they can improve your economic conditions sometimes to help with that. Um, depression, so it's, there's a mood, which is feeling sad, but then there's a disorder, which is diagnosable. Um, the actual diagnosis is by the DSM-5 criteria, so five of the following symptoms within the same two-week period, um, and it's a change from your previous functioning or how you were. And at least one of these is going to be depressed mood or loss of interest in things that would normally interest you. Um, possible causes could be neurotransmitter dysregulation. Um, there's also the idea of cognitive bias, which we were talking about before, like nobody likes me. I'm going to die alone. Um, and then there's social, which is like, you might be impacted by things that have happened in your life to make you think this way. Um, treatment, so there's both psychological and pharmacological. Um, you can look through that in your own time. Um, adolescent onset schizophrenia. So that's often from about 1925. So like adolescence to adulthood. Um, there's also the same DSM-5 criteria, but it's different symptoms. Um, so two or more of the following for over one month or longer. Uh, I've got a list there. Um, I'm just going to run out of time, I think I am. Um, causes, it's likely a combination of different factors. And treatment, um, it can only treat symptoms. So antipsychotics only treat symptoms. Um, and they block dopamine and serotonin. Um, continuing on, there's also psychosocial. So you've got some cognitive techniques to help you with blocking out delusions or hallucinations. Um, social skills training, you can go have help with rehabilitation. Um, and there's also family education. The difference between a delusion and hallucination. So a delusion is something that you believe in that seems real to you. Um, hallucination is something that you actually perceive. So it's either like a sound or a sight and um, there's actually nothing there, but you think there's something there. So that's the difference. So delusions are like purely inside your head. Okay, personality disorders. Um, quick questions. So answers B, this one. Answer is E, and we'll go over all of these. Uh, I think this is the last one. Answer to this one would be C. Okay, 
So we'll go over all of these. So personality disorders um, are basically when you've got personality traits that are different from what you would expect them to be, um, they're pervasive and they're inflexible, so you can't change them. Um, this is also onset in adolescence or early adulthood. It can be caused by either nature or nurture. So there's a bunch of factors again. And there's three clusters, A, B, C. Um, this is just a five-factor model. So like uh, if you want to grade your personality on a scale kind of thing, um, that's from your lecture. You can read through that. Um, cluster A. So cluster A is eccentric or schizophrenia continuum. So paranoid personality disorder is basically not trusting anyone, being really suspicious. Schizoid is actually detaching yourself from those relationships and then having a really restricted range of emotional expression. Schizotypal is being really uncomfortable in close relationships. And you also, um, you have distortions in how you think about others and there's also eccentric behavior. Dramatic or psychopathic, um, so there's antisocial, which is basically violation of the rights of others, so you don't really care about what they think or what they want. Um, borderline personality disorders, having instability in relationships, and you're very impulsive. Um, histrionic personality disorder, you excessively want um, people to notice you, and there's also excessive emotionality, whereas narcissistic is more about grandiosity. In grandiosity, you want people to admire you instead of just, you know, being focused on you, and you also have a lack of empathy for others. Cluster C is anxious and neurotic, so there's avoidant personality disorder, which is basically having uh, social inhibition. You feel like you're inadequate, and you're really sensitive when people um, criticize you. And then dependent is dependent, you're very dependent on others, you're submissive, you're clingy, etc. Um, obsessive, compulsive, um, you really, everything has to be perfect. Okay, um, borderline personality disorder. So that's basically you have instability in um, your relationships with others, how you think about yourself, your emotions, and you also have um, impulsive tendencies. And that begins in early adulthood. It's got um, these symptoms and usually five or more of the following would diagnose you. Um, it's the most common type of personality disorder and it's three times as common in women. Um, often traumatic experiences in early life can predispose you to it um, as well as a lack of protective factors. Um, what else? Yes, treatment. Um, in terms of pharmacolo pharmacological, antidepressants aren't really as useful. Usually it's dialectical behavior therapy, um, which is helping them like cognitive therapy kind of stuff. Um, anxiety, anxiety is not associated with one particular developmental stage. So you can develop it anytime in your life, really. Um, there's normal anxiety, which is a normal emotion, but then there's also the disorder. Um, the disorder is actually classified by having overwhelming feelings of fear and apprehension and you've got symptoms as well. So you can feel your heart racing or you get really breathless or you might like start shaking, um, things like that. Um, and usually that can lead you to avoid things that might feel, you know, make you feel that way. Um, certain periods in your life are associated with certain anxiety disorders, but you could, again, just remember that anxiety can develop anytime. Um, so from childhood, usually it's like separation anxiety disorder, and you might have some specific phobias. Um, late, uh, late childhood and adolescence is social phobia, and then adolescence onwards is usually panic disorder or generalized anxiety. And then middle adulthood is usually panic disorder. So the older you get, the more predisposed you are to panic disorder, basically. Um, causes, there's a bunch, really. Uh, could be multifactorial um, treatment. you got cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and there's also medications, so anti antidepressants and benzodiazepines, but benzodiazepines has a risk of falls. So be careful if you're using it in someone who you think might, you know, fracture something. Uh, suicide. So there's a three-step theory from ideation to action. So basically, first you develop the idea, um, and that's usually due to pain or hopelessness, um, and then you exacerbate it because you don't feel like you're very well connected to others who might feel lonely. And then number three is where you actually decide, that's it, I'm gonna do it. Um, and that's usually facilitated by three things. Um, dispositional, so genetics, um, acquired, where it's like you're used to pain, so you're kind of like numb to it, and then practical, so knowing how um, to take your life, I guess. Um, 
And this theory helps us to target people who might be at risk, et cetera. Um, prevention, they're uh, like educating doctors about suicide um, and how to recognize it and treat it, um, restricting your access to lethal means, treating your underlying illness that might be causing you to think this way. And then there's also an app for management. Okay, um, last bit. So normal aging, elderly, death and dying, and a lot of other stuff. So the answer to that is B. All right, so normal aging is basically progressive, universal, species specific and intrinsic. Um, it's, you, the older you get, the more susceptible you are to disease. And obviously the older you get, the more it will affect how you function. Um, there's a risk of cascade iatrogenesis, which is basically if you go into hospital for one thing, you're more likely to get another thing and then another thing and then another thing. Um, and natural death is when you meet your maximum lifespan. Um, body system changes. Honestly, I didn't memorize any of this. Do you need to know it? I don't know. Just kind of makes sense. You know what happens when you get older. You can kind of just work it through logically. Um, if you want to read it, it's here. Um, dementia. So dementia is characterized by declining memory, learning attention. Um, you might get more confused. You might have difficulties in language, might change personality and behavior, but you can't actually diagnose dementia until after you passed away. So only post-mortem can we say for sure you had dementia. Um, treatment, you don't really have many pharmacological treatments. So usually it's non-pharmacological and usually it's just symptoms. Um, and things you might consider for someone with dementia is can they actually drive? Would they need someone to make decisions for them when they can't anymore? And also think about end-of-life care. Okay, delirium. Symptoms of delirium are confusion, hallucinations, inattention, agitation, and altered consciousness. There are many causes and the diagnosis test is on the right. I'm not going to read through that. Um, depression. So depression is tested for by this screening test. Um, a positive response is no, yes, 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 yes. Um, if you're positive for less than one, then you stop because you're like, all right, they're, they're all good. If you're positive to more than two, then you would most likely get a full screen. Um, frailty is basically a syndrome where you've got more than three of the following. Um, that I've listed there. It's associated with older age, women uh, having a lower education, income, poor health, and comorbidities present. Um, and it's predictive of basically a uh, high risk of falls, worsening mobility, hospitalization, and even death. Oh, two minutes. Okay, okay. Um, take like 10 seconds. <laughs> I'm just going to go through this. It's E. Uh, okay. Definitions of death. So you can read through this yourself. This is very low yield. I wouldn't bother. Um, there's some different types of death. So it could be sudden and unexpected or sudden and expected, or it could be expected and prolonged. Um, and obviously how you experience that death will depend on a lot of things, which I've written there. Um, the stages of dying this is kind of important. So there's basically five stages, but you can you don't have to go through them in order and not everyone will go through all of the stages. Um, and you can read through that as well. But it's basically what the name suggests it is. Um, grief basically is about um, you choosing to find a way to cope. Um, I'm just, I've got one minute. Uh, it's, it's how you choose to cope and you can read through that as well because I've written everything down. And I think my English isn't that bad, so it probably makes sense. Advanced care planning is basically you choosing um, either to, you, you basically write down what you want after you can no longer decide for yourself and you can get someone else um, to decide for you as well. And you can write that down. And there's instructional ones, which are about something you definitely do or don't want. And there's values ones, which are more about your values and what you value. And then they will make a decision based on that. Um, and then lastly, volunteer assisted dying. Those are some criteria. That's not all of them. That's the most important ones. And obviously you can only get volunteer assisted dying if it's voluntary and the requests are clear and it's not your doctor telling you, hey, look, I think you should die right now. Um, so you need to make that decision. Um, the difference between that and euthanasia is that voluntary assisted dying is you take 
the lethal drug yourself, where the euthanasia is where the doctor gives it to you. And I think that's it. That's it. Okay, I finished just in time. Um, if you have any questions, yes, the Kubler Ross model is the same as the Sagers brief, I'm pretty sure. If I go back real quick, this one, yes. Oh, no, 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 grief. Hold on. Um, yes, no, 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 you're right. It is grief. Um, yes. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, message me on Facebook or you can email me. I don't mind.